Mike said, I'm from East Central Indiana. I am a field manager with the Soil Health Partnership. I cover Northern Indiana, Northern Ohio, and Michigan. Um, a little bit about myself outside of being part of the family farm. My interest in agriculture probably derived from my days of being an FFA in high school. I had a real big interest in soil judging. Um, I took that interest and went to Purdue University and got a degree in agronomy and environmental science, which I thought was very valid to bring back to the farm. As a farmer and a student in environmental science, I've always had an interest in soil conservation. The beauty of my role with SHP is I get to work with farmers who also share this same uh, view on soil conservation. We work on ways to create the best profitable, or profitable solutions for their farm. I love the open and candid conversations I get to have daily with my growers. Whether I'm wearing my SHP hat or my farmer hat, it's just really fun because I get to educate my growers just as much as they educate me. It's just a real synergistic relationship focused on the future of production agriculture. Our partnership does a lot for both growers and our sponsors. At our car, we are an on-farm, uh, excuse me, an on-farm trial that is a farmer-led initiative. We work with over 220 farms across the Corn Belt. We do uh, plots working at how to manage cover crops, how to reduce the reliance on tillage in our profitable or our more productive soil health systems where guys have been cover cropping and no-tilling for years. We uh, look at how to maximize the rates in which nutrients are applied. As a field manager with that partnership, I get to work with farmers daily setting up these plots and manage all the data and information going in and out. Some of the data that we measure is soil health, uh, hybrid selection, yield, herbicides, fertilizer, and the economics of producing this crop. As Mike mentioned, the economic piece is very interesting to me because as a farmer, if a system doesn't make sense financially or doesn't pay, why would we do it? I believe the partnership does a really good job with this and that's where our soil tests come into play. Growers of mine that's been in the program for four to five years have actually began to see upticks in both their organic matter, water holding capacity, and in some cases, aggregate stability for their soils. The initial analysis of our partnership as a whole has seen that farmers that have been in the program for two to three years have actually seen a one-fifth percent increase in their organic matter. Now, when you think about it, one-fifth of percent is not really a lot. But when you do the research and to see how fast organic matter actually increases, being able to see that one-fifth percent over two years is a really key indicator that we are increasing soil health on those operations. Another cool thing within the partnership, at least I think so, is that these guys that are doing these cover crop plots have actually uh, not seen a yield reduction. As a farmer, when I know I talk to other farmers, guys will say, I can't raise cover crops, I'm going to take a 20 bushel yield loss on my farm. Well, with all the data that we are combining in our, in our partnership, we're not seeing that. The yield has been flat to same, so we as a partnership can say that you can try this soil health practice on your farm and not lose or not have any yield reduction, which is pretty cool for both the farm and the partnership. During my first 18 months with the partnership, there has been a lot of positives and benefits that's come through these trials. To begin with, I look at our no-till and our strip-till systems. There is a clear cost savings for these growers as they are making less passes across that farm. They're saving on machinery use, fuel use, time, and labor. And then on the, on the back end, as they stay in these no-till systems, these soils are going to become more productive, saving those farmers a lot of money on costly farm inputs later in the years. Another thing about no-till is on my own operation, as we mentioned, I am from a family farm, and so there's a lot of dynamics that go into that. Uh, my grandfather's 86 years old and he still farms and he's got the ways, you know, the old stubborn ways and ways he's farmed. So as I joined the partnership in 2017 and I started, had a bigger role in the farm, I decided I was going to start doing things my own way. And so we no-tilled some corn and as Betsy mentioned last year in uh, 2018, the harvest was just pretty much terrible as it was wet and went on forever. And it was one day, I think it was, I think it was like two days after we got, I don't know, a half inch of rain and we decided we are going to go try and shell some corn. Grandpa went to his field and tried to shell it and all he did was rut it up. Just there was no structure in that field because he had fully, you know, had full tillage system in, in place. Um, we went down to my field that I no tilled that spring and lo and behold the combine and the grain cart went across with no issues. We had no compaction, um, no ruts, and actually no tilled beans back into that field this year. Um, and actually kind of made a believer out of my grandpa. But the cool thing was is that actually saved us a couple days during that wet harvest because in our area there is a lot of full tillage. And as guys were sitting at home twiddling their thumbs, we're shelling 230 bushel corn and taking it to the elevator with no line and it just saved us a lot of days. So it was 
a pretty big benefit that you can't actually put a dollar amount to, but you can just see that side of things. This year with the spring, I had a lot of growers who are doing the no-till and the cover crop have the same experience. Those were the fields that they got planted compared to the ones that they were still doing tillage in that ended up taking preventative plant because the soil structure was, just wasn't there. In some of our cover crop trials, we've actually seen some pretty cool things as well. Um, growers that are in the highly erodible land or land with a lot of rolling hills have had great success of getting good, these good cover crop stands to hold um, the nutrients and keep their topsoil in place. You know, with the heavy rains that we had this spring, you know, anything to help keep everything there was a great success. And that just rang true with a lot of these cover crop plots. Another cool thing is growers are getting very good weed suppression with that. As a farmer, you know, herbicide resistant weeds are becoming a real big thing in 2019. Growers are getting a lot better uh, successful and the more effective rates from their sp spring burn down and residuals with these cover crops as they are choking out all of these herbicide resistant weeds, which is pretty cool to see. And some of our more productive soils that I've mentioned in our nutrient uh, management plots, growers who have had, um, who are getting really good uh, cocktail mixes out are actually, these cover crops are producing and scavenging nutrients that are essential to that cash crop, saving the grower money on uh, fertilizer and manure use, which is kind of cool. Now I just mentioned that there are a lot of these great things that come with these soil health practices, but as Barry mentioned that there is a lot of risk involved with that. That's where the beauty, I think, with my role with SHP comes into play. We look at a grower, when we work with growers, we take one field of their operation and we say, hey, how are we going to work with no-till, cover crops, you know, nutrient management on that farm? And we try to figure out ways to mitigate all the risk going into that one field. We are with them for five years, it's a five-year sign-up, so that they can take the time and effort to learn and to expand it out to their operation. We're not saying, hey, let's go gun-ho year one and then, you know, you're going to have fits and it's not going to work. We work with the grower, hopefully, as the five years goes on to help increase those acres in a profitable manner and help mitigate the risk that goes into that. As I just mentioned, there are a lot of on-farm benefits, but we must not forget that when we reduce tillage and increase cover crops, there are many off-farm benefits as well. As I mentioned earlier, with some of these spring rains that we had, um, having a, something growing out there on the farm or just reducing the tillage is cleaning up our water system, creating better quantity and quality for our waters. There has also been some research looking into the way that agricultural soils can store carbon. It is of the belief that if farmers increase their soil health management practices, that this will actually lower the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced. Also, it'll increase the amount, of, uh, increase the amount that the agricultural soils can sequester the carbon. That, is, that tied with broader societal efforts may actually help mitigate the potential of climate change, which is pretty cool to think about. So as I look forward to the future of soil health tied with SHP, I can't help but be excited. As Jane mentioned, doing the you know, farmer's talks, that's, we actually encourage our, the vast majority of our growers to host a field day. I get to work with these growers just setting up these field days. A lot of it is, is the farmers networking. They're sitting down, you know, hey, come over to my shop, we're gonna do this, and just, they just learn from each other. It's really cool to see as if, you know, when I'm giving these talks to my farmers and working with them, it seems like the guys sitting there taking notes and just looking through and hey, you know, trying to get the most out of it are the, the neighbors that are the full tillage guys, the guys that are not really looking and doing any soil health practices. They're the ones that are coming up to me afterwards. Hey, how can I get involved? How can I, you know, can we set up a type of trial, you know, like this on my farm? It's that type of energy that's really exciting to see because I think that's what's going to drive the future of uh, these soil health practices. Um, I just, the saying that the early bird gets a worm is really gonna ring true because farmers are competitive and it's going to be, I don't think that there's going to be this great, you know, technology change or chemistry change that's going to push SHP. It's going, or going to push soil health practices. It's going to be farmers looking inward and figuring out how do I make this work? I believe there is going to be some type of incentive on the end user um, product or people are going to want sustainable products and that's going to help push these farmers to look, hey, how can I, you know, if I produce soybeans in a no-till manner and I can get paid an extra $10, how can I do that across my acres? And I think that's just really exciting to see and I think that farmers are going to, um, you know, just really grab hold of that and take care of that. So as other farmers, as, you know, conservationists, I just encourage all of you to educate yourselves on what farmers are doing in your area um, and just support them. You know, be a sounding board, bounce ideas back off or back and forth with them. And just, you know, just like I said, just support them because if, you know, 
they're being different. And you know, sometimes and being different can be cool for some people and for other people it can just be uncomfortable. So if providing support can just be a really great balancing act for them. And just in the words of like FDR, he said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. So just keep that in mind when we're having these conversations. So now is the time to be excited about the future of soil health.